Okay, sorry about that uh, pause for the moment, but let's pick it up. Here you have the uh, here you have three parts of a claim, and this analytical claim is the same sort of thing that we discussed with step of speech, but we are also discussing with Friday Night Lights. We're using the same framework. Obviously, we have an author, that author being Kissinger. What's the title? But specifically, let's look at chapters. Oh, look at that. Quotey quote quotes. I like that. Thank you for mentioning that the small title requires quotation marks, not italics. Now, in your sentence, if you want to write in the watermelon seed a chapter of Friday Night Lights, or you say in Friday Night Lights chapter the watermelon seed, something like that, that would be fine. And you say Bissinger does whatever. Effects. We're looking at three different possible effects. Uh, Tori, what are the three different possible domains of effects that we have here? Yes, we got logos. What else, Tori? Ethos and pathos. Thank you very much. Now let's ramp it up for a moment. Let's say, as we discussed on Thursday, I'm looking at a claim of pathos. Connor, pathos means bringing about what? Emotion. Very good, bringing about emotion. Um, but it's not enough for me to say in Friday Night Lights, Bissinger develops a claim of pathos. In fact, I've told you specifically I don't want to see the word pathos in your claims. So instead, what sort of information should I see if I'm developing a claim of pathos? Daniel? Specific emotion. Can you give me one emotion? Yeah, sure. Happiness. Okay. Um, how about, uh, I'm going to change yours a little bit. How about excitement? Ex good. In the watermelon feed in Friday Night Lights, Bissinger develops excitement for the reader. Josiah? Anxiety. I would say we develop anxiety very much um, as well. And I feel it there. I also feel it in the prologue. Excitement and anxiety. Maybe some of the same emotions are being developed in the watermelon feed as were developed in the prologue. All right, great. When we get to ethos and when we get to logos, I'll talk about specifically how we focus those effects. But right now, for pathos, all you need to do is focus on an emotion. What's missing? Thank you, Daniel. The device. We took some time on Thursday to talk about different sorts of devices, and I asked you to look through Odessa and find examples of how he's developing this test. Then we categorized those devices into four different areas. Do you recall any of those areas? Jay, can you give me one of the four different areas of device that we talked about on Thursday? We had examples from Odessa that were developing disgust. And when you guys gave me those examples, that was a group activity that you did? I'll tell you what, Jake, uh, after somebody lists one, maybe you'll remember some of the others and you can raise your hand. Tori? Loaded language. Excellent. And Tori, can you define loaded language for me? Very good at creating an emotional impact. Now, Tori, um, you've got two answers. Excellent. Let's see if we can go for the third. What level of meaning in a word carries its emotional impact? There are two different levels of meaning in every word. Fancy words we got there. Sorry, you're doing awesome today, Tori. Don't worry about it. J er, Josiah? No. Jake, are you answering this question? No. Another example? Okay, we'll get to you in just a moment. Nobody remembers the two levels of meaning every word have, has? Sorry. You've learned that this year. You learned it last year. You learned it several times over. Cool. Come on, folks. Connotation, denotation. Still, I'm not getting the recognition? Ooh. Ouch. 
Denotation is the literal meaning of a term. Connotation is the associated images or feelings, any sort of non-rational associations with the word. So if I use, and I'll, I always go back, and you guys seem to need some reteaching here, I always go back to Malcolm X's lessons on learning the connotation of words. As he looks up in the dictionary the word black, he finds out that it has some literal meaning, but he also finds out connotations. And he finds out that uh, the very language of American society is racist when he sees that black carries connotations of sin, um, anger, hate, well, not so much anger, sorry, sin, depression, uh, foreboding, and um, something being soiled or being marred. And he sees that black itself seems to be a negative word. What does black mean literally? It's a color or shade or it's a, a physics um, property, the absence of light, whatever. Those are its literal meanings. But its connotations are all severely negative. And then, of course, he pages through the dictionary and finds out that white carries all the opposite connotations, pure, innocent, and so on. So it was an interesting exercise in Malcolm X's autobiography in which he learns that language itself for American society seems to be racist. But he only learns that on the level of connotation. Loaded language plays on connotation. Well, certainly. Connor, I think you could say that uh, it's not so much that we created it as that we inherited it, perhaps. True. Um, however, uh, American society likes to inherit certain qualities and amplify them because we like to make everything bigger. So I would say that American society in the 20th century took some of those qualities of racism and inherent language and made them much more extreme. Jake, you had another. Oh, yeah, 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 the, the mouthful of sand. The gritty mouthful of sand is the first experience for many people in Odessa because of the sandstorm. Does anybody remember which category that was? Tori. That was imagery. Excellent. We got two. Statistics. We got three. Nate. Excellent. Personal testimony. Thank you, Nate. And Nate, personal testimony always involves what? What will I see on the page if, if he's dealing in personal testimony? Yeah, quotation marks. Very good. Thank you, Josiah, for the, the manic help there that you gave. Um, yes, quotations. Individual statements and observations from individual people. All right, so we have four different areas of device. I want you working through this entire book, or at least all the portions that we will read, recognizing device after device and asking yourself all the way down to the very level of the word to the very structure of an overall chapter what he's doing in regard to emotion, credibility, and logic. And I want you to have a large list of devices at your disposal. We only have four right now, so let's make that list longer. Today, we'll be talking about what literary devices Bissinger is using, what rhetorical devices he's using to create this effect, and forgive me, we're going to shift a little bit into lecture mode where I'm going to give you some devices and some definitions. You'll write those down. But the application will start tomorrow where you'll uh, see some of these in actual experience. We're going to start, and you're going to see throughout some that you've already seen. So we've seen loaded language. We just talked about it. We talked about language which sparks that emotional response through its connotation. But... Let's always, uh, you know, elevate this lecture and discussion by seeing examples. Somebody give me an example of Bissinger using loaded language for a certain effect. Jasmine, Jeff? Certainly, let's find a specific example. It doesn't hurt to find a new one. It doesn't hurt to find one that we've already been over. Jake? 34 in the big book, folks. Okay. 
Very good. Excellent. Um, so the use of the, the word asshole to refer to a person sparks an emotional response because it's rather extreme. And the person reading that feels sort of the bite and the pain of that word. Makes them a little bit angry and disgusted. Good. He picked it for its emotional connotation. Shelby. Oh, I'm sorry. What page was that again? 34 in the big book. By the way, recommendation. Um, if I'm studying a book, if I actually have to teach the book and I'm, I'm studying it um, and I own it, it's marked. Good. Write in it. Highlight. Do what you want. Because if you are here in a timed environment where I'm saying, hey, you've got to write this before the end of the period and you're looking for examples, chances are really good we've already gone over the examples in lecture. All you have to do is open your book and look for them. And if they're marked, hey, that's great. If you're borrowing this from the library, please don't write in it. <laughs> and if you're borrowing it from a friend who's done it in another class, please ask permission before you do that. But if it's through a book, mark these examples. Shelby, you had another example. Um, on page 30 in the big book. 30 in the big book. When he is describing what that thing is, that this must not be seen as pulling a soldier from you. This must be a hospital by the troops or for veterans. Great. So the use of the word hell sparks uh, an intense negative emotional reaction also. Good. Daniel. What page in the small book? Um, XXXVI. So 36. Yep. Good. We talked about how Bissinger drops into Jerry McDougall's voice and uses the profanity that McDougal would use. And that profanity, of course, speaks to his authentic psychological state. In other words, what it's like to be him. But um, the use of those words also makes it a little bit more uh, attention-grabbing, a little bit more painful, a little bit more intense. Good. You guys are seeing the examples. Let's move on to something else. Ah, new terminology. Jargon and slang. I throw these up together because they are related. Both jargon and slang refer to an author's use of words. And that means an author's diction. Yes, the word diction is related to the word dictionary. If you're saying, hey, I love the author's diction on this page, it's really lively. You're saying, I love the author's word choice, choice of individual words. Loaded language was a question of diction also. Why would you use the word hell when you could just use the word unpleasant? One is more extreme than the other. Okay, that works. Anybody encounter the word jargon before and know what this means? No. Okay. Well, well heard it before? Uh, let's see who I intend to pick on. Um, Kate, you're a musician. I know. Picking on you for a different reason. Don't worry. I'll get around to it. Me too. I'll pick on you. I'll pick on everybody. I have equal opportunity. Pick or honor. Jake, you're, an, you're a musician. Can you see? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are Renaissance people here. Um, can you throw out some terminology that you know as a musician that the average non-music playing public has no clue what you're talking about? Half notes, quarter notes. It's not bad. Uh, I have a vague understanding of that because we've all been through elementary school, right? And we all know about uh, notes and, and issues like that. You are correct. You've answered my question correctly. But let's go a little bit more extreme. Can you think of uh, really obscure terms that I'm not going to have any clue about? Oh, trilling. Good. Jake, I want you to think for a moment. I love that you're explaining, but I want you to think for a moment. I want you to construct a sentence using the word trilling, so that if I had no clue what trilling meant, the sentence wouldn't make any sense. Okay, train makes a halting stop with a trilling sound. Although, you're, I'm sorry, Jesse? Choo-choo. Yes. Yes. I was thinking, Jake, more of a sentence that you might use to describe music. So if I said um, the, uh, the, the band director was upset at our, uh, our inability to trill in the way that she wanted to, 
Would that be a, would that, does that sentence make sense to you as a musician? Uh, a little? A little? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Jargon is language which is very specific to a discipline of study, but it's unfamiliar to those outside of it. So music has its own jargon. Teaching has its own jargon. You ever heard the term pedagogical before? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Because you're not a teacher. Right. Correct. Do you know what a behavioral objective is? Yeah? Oh, excellent. So you have some familiarity because you know somebody who's in the business. Give me some football jargon. Now I'm picking on you, Josiah. Something I wouldn't understand. And trust me, it's not that hard with me. I know very little about sports. PAT? I don't. What's PAT? Oh, okay. No, hold on. Wait. Point after touchdown, PAT. I taught students Friday Night Lights who didn't know what a down was. And you're sitting there, it's like, what? Huh? Such people exist? Yes, such people exist. I, don't, I, I have to admit, I don't understand what a safety is. But that's because I'm not a football. I'm not a football fan, nor am I a football player. Jargon is specific language for a discipline of study. It doesn't really have application outside that field of study. So PAT is not something you talk about when you talk about your English homework. Oh, did you get that PAT in English class today? What? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, I've learned trilling in band class, and yeah, we're going to learn trilling next time in uh, English, and then we're going to do some trilling in math. What? No. It's specific. When somebody uses jargon in a sentence, what's the effect on the listener? Okay, somebody might be familiar. So if somebody, if you're using football jargon with me and I know football and love football, what's my reaction to the conversation, Josiah? So it brings me in, right? It makes me what? Sure. It, it brings me in. It attracts me. It's wor it, These are words that make me want to listen to you. Which of the three devices in my building? Or which of the three claims? It makes me want to listen to you because I feel comfortable speaking in a language that you're speaking in. I'm sorry? It does. Absolutely. The identity of the speaker. Now, let's say I don't know anything about football, and you're throwing football terminology around. What sort of reaction do I have? Confusion, but how do I feel about you? Well, possibly. I might feel alienated. I might say, oh, man, just get away from me. I don't understand a thing you're saying. Bingo. Say that again. Therefore, you're more or less likely to believe them if they're using ter jargon. Correct. If somebody's using football jargon, are they more or less believable in speaking about football? More. Bingo. So jargon, properly used, announces who the speaker is and helps me understand whether or not they're believable. But it can have an alienating effect as well. Slang does the same thing. And remember we were talking about the text messaging? Using slang can announce the authority of the speaker. And slang can work or slang can backfire. So if Amanda's texting her friends in slang, then chances are her friends are made comfortable and are more likely to listen to her. If she's texting them in proper English with full capitalization and punctuation and everything, chances are they're going to think that she's strange and not answer her text or possibly answer them in a ridiculing kind of fashion. Jargon or slang, both of these, both of these are language which invite the reader into a specific community of discussion. Specific people have this discussion. It can help build ethos. They can destroy ethos too if you use the wrong one at the wrong time. Do you feel that Bissinger is using a heavy amount of football jargon or a light amount of football jargon so far? I'd say light also. Why? Because, you know, 
Why? Okay, but the prologue was, to a certain extent. I'll tell you what, Josiah, I've read the entire book. He doesn't get all that much heavier with the jargon than this. Yeah. Why? What does he want the book to be about? The community, and he wants to be the book about, he wants the book to be about America and American culture. Who does he want reading the book? Everybody. I, I don't care about football. I'll admit that, and I know some of my students get angry with me about that. I don't care about football. I don't watch football. I'm not a big sports nut, but if I had my sport, it would be baseball. Sorry. Don't mean to offend anybody. Thank you, Jordan. But hold on. I love this book. I think this book is fantastic. It makes me want to like football at times. It really generates some excitement. But it's accessible. Watch for those times when he does use football jargon. Think in those moments why he suddenly drops into using football jargon and what impact it has. So when you're reading through the book and football jargon appears, and if you don't know how many people here have no clue about football jargon, you wouldn't know. Okay, so Shelby, Tori, you're reading through and suddenly some, and Jasmine, you're okay on it, suddenly some, he writes in some word that you have no clue and you think that must be a football term. Note it. Bring it to class. Pay attention. He's using jargon. Next, we're still talking sort of, uh, all this is kind of related. It's about use of language, but here we're going to uh, advance it to some other concepts. Talking about the difference between a formal and informal voice, and I'll give you a definition immediately. This is the uh, personal approach of the author to the listener. Think about this class. Do I speak to you in a formal or an informal voice? Formal voice. What does that mean, Daniel? But how do I qualify that? How do you know that I'm speaking professionally? <laughs> you mean the, the words that you don't understand sometimes? Okay, so a sophisticated, um, Shelby says, a sophisticated diction, sophisticated word cho choice. That's a form, right. I don't use shortcuts. I don't use words like thing. I don't use slang, right? So I don't use slang. I use sophisticated, specific terminology. Yeah, but that's different. I'm talking about the way I craft my sentences, the way I express my ideas. Do you believe it's formal? Something of that probably has to do with my tone of voice and the way in which I speak. Some of it is also related to the length and um, clarity of my sentences. My sentences tend to be shorter, clearer. They don't tend to ramble all that much because I'm speaking in a very formal voice. Do you believe that I speak this way with my friends and family? <laughs> some of you are saying, yes, Mr. Clarkson. I think s some of my students have believed that I, I mow my lawn in a tie. No. I know, that's be uh, it's a long story. Um, people change the way they're speaking based upon audiences. And sometimes they're formal and sometimes they're informal. And I certainly hope you master this when you go into a job interview. Because if you don't, you're going to have a problem finding a decent job. You better learn to adopt an informal voice. And sometimes you can be really sophisticated by being, uh, I'm sorry, a formal voice. Sometimes you can be very sophisticated by merging formal and informal. But it looks like you're formal, but you're dropping into some informality just to appear human. I try to do that sometimes too. Why? I love it, Josiah. It's a great reaction because nobody likes robots. So how would you feel if I never appeared human in my voice? Bored. What if I were always informal in my voice toward you? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Josiah. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. If I am totally informal, you don't respect me, you don't have trust in me, you don't believe my authority, and you are much less likely to go to the places where I want you to go. If I am totally formal, I alienate you because you feel like I'm something that is alien from you, totally different. You have no interest in listening to me for another reason. So I balance the two. So will Bissinger. 
I want you to find a place in the book, anywhere, where you feel for two sentences he's being totally formal. I want two sentences out of the book where you think he's being formal. And by the way, if you understand what I'm talking about right now, you should know where he'd want to be formal and where he wouldn't. Be able to find something where you think he would like to be formal. Go ahead, Shelby. Six. Six and then an extra point they can uh, they can kick for a field goal if you make it. Yeah. Yes, Jake, what do you got? What page? Big book? Fifty one and what uh, what sentences do you have there? Nervousness? Okay. Uh, good, 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 good. What makes you say that that is formal voice? Oh, good. He's not playing any tricks, right? There doesn't seem to be any emotion in it. So perhaps the lack of emotion would make more formal a voice. I agree with you on that, Jake. Good observation. Um, what? I know this is going to be confusing because I'm going to talk about voice and voice. But when I talk about voice, like narrative perspective, there are three of them. Do you remember what they are? First, second, and third. Jake, is that first, second, or third person voice? Uh, second uses the you. You first uses the I. <laughs> it's third. It's third. Yeah. First, do you remember reading so far? Josiah, any time that he talks about himself personally, Kissinger, he, like he says, I, I, I. No? No? That would be a quote. We're talking about his own writing, Kissinger's own voice, not the, not somebody else's voice. Connor, you have one too? What page? 15 in the small book. Go ahead and read. You could stop there, but yeah, you just list the, um, not only third person voice, but what else do you note about your sentences that make you think this person is educated and serious? <coughs> Good, no opinion, no first person voice. What else? That struck me. I liked that passage. What? Uh, not so much statistics as the word choice itself. Um, Connor, pick out some words in there that you think sound pretty sophisticated and formal. Conservatism. Conservatism. Give me one more. Maddening. Maddening's pretty good. I was also thinking of the word stolid. Um, these words seem to be um, advanced, sophisticated, and speak to the formality and education of the pers he person. He wants to seem authoritative. And the formal voice does that. And the informal voice will create that human connection. One of my favorite words in the study of literature, juxtaposition. Juxtaposition. All right, come on, come on, let's try it. Juxtaposition. Nice. That is the noun. That is the verb. Juxtapose. So if you juxtapose two items, you are engaging in juxtaposition. Now you say, okay, Mr. Clarkson, what is that? Um, that's when you place two objects or things right next to each other without explaining why, and the placement next to each other should carry the meaning. Give me an example. It'll come through the example. I'll do a micro example that's more of a poetry example than anything else. 
grandma, right? You understand the word? Yes, okay, good. Raisin, you understand the word, right? What do I get by placing the two of them together? Sorry, Zach, answer, everybody else is shouting the answer, out the answers, but you've been polite. Zach, what happens if I place grandma and raisin together? What do you get? Yeah. You think the raisin's wrinkly. Excellent. So the, the idea of grandma informs the appearance of the raisin. Very good. What else? <laughs> okay. That's, that's, ex that's an extension. She bra bakes raisin cookies. Because raisins are wrinkly and shriveled up, right? Maybe she likes raisins. That's entirely possible. However, Shelby and Jasmine, I think yours are, are um, going off a little bit, stretching. This sort of poetry example, and I say poetry because it's more focused on individual words and their unit. Grandma and raisin, you throw them together to create an image of grandma in your mind. But notice I have not written a sentence that says, Grandma looked as shriveled as a raisin. All I did was put the two together and expect you to make the connection. Now, there's an interesting side effect. You might go off into other connections that I hadn't anticipated, as Jasmine and Shelby just showed. Or you might go straight to the imagery idea, as Zach and Josiah did. So either way, the point is that I, as an author, have included these two right next to each other for that effect specifically. We'll pick up on the list tomorrow.